<coughs> Arthur Matthews, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much again. <laughs> what are you uh, What are you working on at the moment? Um, I'm working on something with Rob Delaney. Um, yeah. He had a few pilots commissioned uh, by Channel 4, so he asked me to write one, so I've written one for him. I've done something with Matt Berry, um, who I did Toast, mm. a show called Toast with, about Brexit. Right. Um, what's it called? It's called The Road to Brexit, which yeah. is just using old document. Mostly, he presents it, Matt, not as himself, but it's mostly old um, found footage documentary stuff and just revoice a lot of it, which is quite fun. And what kind of stuff, like, and the, the, it's about the road to Brexit. It's about the road to Brexit, yeah. how Britain got to Brexit. Like, so it's the history of the European community in Britain. So it's like, I found this brilliant footage of Billy Idol in 1977 yeah. in Australia, where he's got this, this an interview with his back to camera talking to Billy Idol. And it's a really long, rambling question and, uh, uh, about punk. And I just revoiced that with someone that telling loads of U U European directives <laughs> right. and fish <laughs> quotas and all this. Yeah. So it's great because Billy's going kind of going like this for ages, and at the end he just says, "I don't know, we just like play rock and roll." <laughs> so, um, so I, I like revoicing stuff and, and yeah. using footage and just taking out of context and everything. And you like to sort of dive into old footage then? Yeah, that I love old footage. It. I love archive footage and yeah. This, I've d recently discovered Talking Pictures TV channel. Do you know that? No. It's really good. It's just lots of old films. Right. Um, old TV shows like Gideon's Way, which I remember as a child with John Gregson. There's Public Eye with Alfred Burke, which was on mm. in about 1970, 71. But before, <laughs> before nearly every programme, they have a thing saying, you know, modern viewers might, might find this offensive. Or any, <laughs> right, there's a few old Irish oh, right, films. Okay. There's yeah, few yeah. old Irish films from the 1930s and 40s. Kind of kind of stuff called Lily of Killarney and stuff. And it always says uh, viewers may find uh, this uh, contains um, outdated stereotyping. <laughs> 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 nearly every program has some kind of warning, warning yeah. beforehand, but it's but <laughs> it, some it's great. Like um, I saw a brilliant Peter Sellers film called Heavens Above, which I'd never seen. Right, from, it's a Bolting Brothers film, but it's great and very politically incorrect. Yeah, but it's kind of refreshing, you know. But it's could very you funny. you could do that for because like you you would watch things like so you know then they put on the sort of old election coverage from a night yeah. like that oh stuff. yeah I yeah, watched yeah. all that yeah. uh, there was a brilliant thing on the BBC Parliament channel where they had the full coverage of the 1974 general election yeah. like from from like morning to evening like yeah. 14 hours of <laughs> 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 I didn't watch all of it that should probably life. come with some sort of warning as well for the modern yeah. viewer I'd say but um, yeah no I love all that anything before 1978 I kind of really like but Public Eye is 90, and, and things like the exteriors on it are shot on video, not on film. Mm. So that gives me a strange thrill as well. Right. I don't know why. And old football. I watched this, I got this match, the, or the big match, DVD, yeah. um, Brian Moore, from the studio. It's not even any football on it. It's just mm -hmm. like readers' letters and... Uh, um, goal at the reviews of the season and that, and I just found, I just find that stuff fascinating. You know, the turn of the sixties going into the seventies, yeah. and also, sorry, I'm going really going on about this, but um, I've really started watching the Avengers a lot recently from the sixties right. with um, the, Rake, the wonderful though. Diana yeah, Rake. Yeah. yeah, but brilliantly, here's the thing: uh, I watched the Rev Rev Avengers from 68, 67, 68, 69. But I've worked out, I've worked with four of the actors that were in the Avengers, either in Father Ted or Toast of London. Really? Who? Yeah. Three, three, the three in Father Ted was, was an actor called Patrick Kavna, Rio Fanning, and... Rio Fanning's my uncle. My goodness! Yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah. how extraordinary. Yeah. Yes, you've got the same name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was wow. my uncle. Yeah, he only di he died a couple of weeks ago. He died a few weeks yeah, ago. Oh, yeah, I did not know yeah. that. How extraordinary. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to him. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the other guy was, what was his name? He's a very foreign sounding name. And he was one of the, I think he was one of the Nazi priests in Father Ted. Mm -hmm. But Rio Fanning, that's extraordinary. Yeah. He was in at least two episodes of the Avengers. He was in, he was in Blake Seven. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he was in a few things like that. He was kind of he used to kind of we never we he was he went to London obviously, and we used yeah. to occasionally as a kid you'd be suddenly watching television at home. Yeah. And he'd appear in something like that. I remember Blake Seven being the one that kind of thrilled me. Yeah. And then he went on to write uh, EastEnders. Did he really? Yeah. yeah, I think I looked him up on Wikipedia, yeah. actually. That's fantastic. And what was he? Was he in, was he in Father Ted? He was, yeah, yeah. Was he? Yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. He, um, I think he was, there's an episode. I lost touch with him, clearly. He yeah, I think there's an episode with Joe Rooney, um, the, where Joe Rooney's got this old parish priest that he's living with, and I think yeah. he's that's Rio Fanning. I think he was a huge QPR fan. Was he? Yeah, massive. He lived around. He lived in Wilson. Yeah. And he was a massive QPR fan, like extreme. Like he used to go to youth, like away youth matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there'd be a bunch of like he'd go on a QPR coach, and it would be yeah. all like twenty-five year olds heading up there, and he'd be in his sixties heading yeah, up. Yeah, brilliant. So he's a massive. Well, QPR I used to fan. go when I moved to London first. The first thing I did <coughs> was three three months of going round every ground. Yeah. But I used to go to QPR. I used to go. I like I like QPR. I used QPR to is great, and it's yeah. a great. Uh, the small box-like stands, and it's great, kind of the the London real, the proper kind of London Irish community there. Yeah. The, all, the pe- all the people who ended up in Shepherd's Bush. Yeah, I used to I used to see them, and I used to go and see Crystal Palace a bit. Mm. But I ended up because I lived in Barn, so I used to go and see Brantford. I went down the divisions. Right, yeah. I started off. You could just pitch up in nineteen ninety one. You could just go up to Highbury and just pay in. But now, but that's all gone. Yeah. Now. Then I had to become like a member. Brentford, Fulham, right? But Brentford was close to me in the train, so and I used to go and see pub them. on every corner. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah, I, I was just reading. Liam Mackey gave me the book, um, the Football Grounds of Great Britain, and that meant they mentioned yeah. Brentford as a pub in every corner. I interviewed right? Stan Bowles in one of those pubs once, but he, he was late because he was in one of the other ones. Yeah, for, yeah. He was yeah. waiting for me in one of the other ones. Yeah, and he was then, then I was in another one, and they, everyone was kind of going, "This is very strange because Stan is never late." Apparently, what, punctuality was his big thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was kind of figuring out maybe it was because of all his gambling. Yeah. That, you know, you'd have to be on time to get a bet on. Was it Sam Bowl? Someone said, one of his managers says, if he could pass a ball the way he <laughs> passes a betting shop. Yeah. <laughs> Stan has got so many great stories. Like, he is, he's one, he, I remember telling you, like, he, he claims that Phil Linnett, like, one of the great kind of missed opportunities of his life was Phil Linnett offered to him the rights to, to Thin Lizzy merchandise. <laughs> And he, <laughs> and he says everything would have been different if I'd taken up that offer. Different. Well, it would have been probably ended up the same, but it would have been different for a while. The, the footballing mavericks, yeah. him and like Frank Worthington, yeah. and Tony Curry, a Sheffield United. Yeah. Tony Curry, when he retired from playing, he didn't really know what to do, so he just I think I think he ended up at QPR. But he used to just get in the tube and go round in the tube all day. Did he? Because he didn't really know what to do when he finished playing football. I don't know if he's still going around in the tube. That's <laughs> thirty years ago. But but go back to like being interested in that period. Like Ryan Tuberty was on the show and he talked mm. about kind of you know sort of the comfort of nostalgia. Yeah, and no, I saw Ryan's interview and I I, th- I did think a lot. Wow, yeah, I can relate to that. I like yeah, yeah. Ryan. He's whenever I bump into him, he's always very nice to me. But yeah, I I definitely and he's got he's got um, uh, John F Kennedy interest yeah. as well. Do you have that? Well, I. I, I go through phases. I read a, a brilliant book called Reclaiming History, which is Vincent Bugliosi's book. Mm. Bugliosi, he wrote the, the Manson family book. He prosecuted Charles Manson. And uh, it's just a mass, I mean, there's 900 pages. You get a CD, ROM, or something with it, which is an uh, extra 900 pages of notes. Because the book is that thick, but still won't take all the notes. Okay. And it's not like 900 notes, it's 900 pages of notes. Mm. But he, it's, it's, it's just a great, it, it just debunks all the, the conspiracy theories. But it's very good, but there's a list of people at the end who've been accused of the being involved in the conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Mm. It's like a really bit three or four pages long. But one of them is uh, Frank Sinatra's drummer. Really? Yeah. I don't know what the connection was, but um, yeah, <laughs> but loads of people. But that's not used. so surprising, really, given some of Frank Sinatra's connections, maybe. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Although Bugliosi discounts the <laughs> mafia angle, he does, right. he just, <coughs> it's a lone gunman, really. Okay. Although that's, it's a really good conspiracy theory joke in it, where two conspiracy theorists go to heaven, and just before they meet God, one says to the other, I'm going to ask him finally, you know, the st- who, you know, who did it? So uh, 
so he asks God and says, who killed Kennedy? And God says, Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone. So this guy turns to the other and he says, this is bigger than we thought. <laughs> 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 well, that's a good conspiracy theory joke. And um, when you do, you think there's any reason why that stuff? Like, do you find it appeals to you more as you get older, going back in into that er- yeah. era? As yeah. I as I become more distant from it, yeah. yeah. But the Avengers, I got, you know, I I that was on ITV4, and I watched a lot. But then, brilliantly, um, the ones I'd missed, I just ordered from the library. You can do this from the library. You can you can order DVDs mm. and they'll just get it for you. It's brilliant. Fantastic. So thanks to the library, I got like series four, five and six of the Avengers and there's loads of extras on it and interviews with directors and, and just bits and bobs like that. But yeah, but it, it looks fantastic in ni- 1967, the colour Avengers. And it's a completely different world, and yet it's much less dated than stuff like the Sweeney, which came along like five or six years afterwards. It's just it's a lot less dated than the Sweeney or this Public Eye thing I've been watching because mm. it's kind of timeless. Whereas the Sweeney just looks very rough, and like the seventies, and like it wasn't as shot on as good quality film or whatever for some reason, so it doesn't look as good as the Avengers. But the Sweeney, like. When you watch it now, everyone everyone who's Irish is just called Paddy. Everyone who's mm. Scottish is Jock. Yeah. And uh, it's just so rough. And uh, But anyway, the, the Avengers is, is completely timeless and, and there's something about it. Because I, you know, I remember watching when I was very young, when yeah. I was like seven or eight. And um, like Ryan, I did love my childhood before, you know, before the complications of adulthood. So yeah, I'm very, I'm very... Um, and I was living somewhere else at the time. We moved when I was eight. So uh, yeah, I am. I'm yeah, I am kind of nostalgic. Yeah, definitely. And do you, when you say you loved your childhood before, was it before you moved that you love it? You look back on it most fondly. No, I was fine. I was fine as a as a, as a child. <laughs> 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 but you know, you get you know, you don't worry. Like I look at my daughter; she's very young. She's only eight, and she doesn't seem to really worry about yeah. you know Brexit. Or yeah. identity politics. There's <laughs> none of that stuff. It's so not worrying about the backstop. Better off. Yeah, yeah. Mm. She's, she's, she doesn't even know what the backstop <laughs> I don't even know what the backstop is. But um, yeah, no, I think childhood is, you know, if, I mean, I wasn't very, my father was very old. I mean, he was born in 1903. So he was, I wasn't very close to him. But um, uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm kind of nostalgic, definitely. Does, but that's a, like, you know, you say you weren't very close to him. Is that something you regret? I do regret it, yeah. I regret not, because he lived it through interesting times. Mm. And his father was a, um, a TD in 19, from 1927 to 1932. Right. Um, so he would have lived through the whole revolutionary period and all that. So I never really talked to him much about that. And then I, my mother's father, he was... That was interesting as well, because he was in the RIC in the 20s. And then witnessed something, some black and tan thing, atrocity or something, and then promptly resigned from the RIC and joined the IRA, I believe. Really? Yeah, but I don't know much about really? that. I only discovered yeah. that he, he joined the IRA from a little clipping after my aunt died. She had a clipping of her father's um, uh, obituary. And it's just a little thing about that, you know. And he was Fianna Fáil, and my, my father's father we've, was a common a gale TD, okay. so it's very different. Um, that would have been a big thing at, the, at that time. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was elected in 27, the year Kevin O'Higgins was assassinated. Mm. So there was two elections that year after O'Higgins was assassinated. There was an election, and he was elected then. But then the devil there, landslide, he lost the seat in 32. Okay. But yeah, but I never really talked to my father much about that, but I would have liked to, yeah. And he was 56 when you were, yeah. were born? Yeah. Uh, That's very good. I'm very impressed by the maths. <laughs> <laughs> Your facts are stored. I've got them all. Because <laughs> it's, it's all I've got in these notes. It just says 56. <laughs> yes. And of course you were born on a Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> the, um, what significance do you think it was being born on a Tuesday? <laughs> yes, you were born shortly after the Suez crisis, yeah. Um, but did you feel that when, because uh, when you were growing up, that he was older than? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah what, how did you feel it? Um, just because other people's um, parents were younger, you know. Mm. Uh, but I'm an older parent now. I mean, yeah. 
my daughter's only eight and uh, so I mean uh, her grandfather was born in 1903 which is incredible really yeah, extraordinary. but she's not that aware of it at the moment but I'm sure we'd be I'd be an increasing utter embarrassment to her <laughs> You but know. there are more p people that are having children later, so it's, it's more yeah, common. Things then. put it off, or yeah. people put it off, you yeah. know, until the very last moment. And were they, were you, like, was, it, was there a reason why uh, he was so, so late to fatherhood? Yeah, there was. He was, yeah. he grew up on the farm. Yeah. And uh, his father died, and then his mother died, and he was essentially, I mean, it's classic stuff, and that. He was living there with his mother in the farm, and then she became ill. Mm. Then she went into the hospital in Navan and that's where my mother was the matron in the hospital and she was looking after okay. his, right. <laughs> his mother and then his mother died and then he you know took up with my mother who okay. was the matron in the infirmary in Navan and um, so she, he was 17 years older than her right um, but he was you know I wasn't close to him but he had a good sense of humor I remember watching Monty Python with him like okay. in, in you know, 1970, and he seemed to like. He loved the th Three Stooges. He liked right. a lot. Yeah. And I used to often think, when you see like Marx Brothers films from the 30s, imagine them playing in in Navan or yeah. in, at the time, what people would have made of it. You know. But he was very, he was um, very honest as well, and quite religious. Um, but I wasn't that close to him really. No. And were you brought up religiously then? Were you yeah, brought yeah. into mass? And well, everyone was. I mean, apart yeah. from you, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I was laughs> You're so. the only one in the country <laughs> which where it wasn't forced to go to mass. It wasn't forced, yeah. Yeah, my two of my uncles were priests. Uh, my father was quite religious, uh, but in a quiet way, like, you know. Yeah. My mother wasn't that religious for her generation, but he was. But, I mean, I was... I. I always thought, I just always scared the hell out of me religion, you know. The idea that the supernatural being is controlling everything is a, you know, you wouldn't want to think about that too much. Yeah. But I did think about it quite a lot. So it, it didn't have a good effect on me at and all. And you worried about it? Yeah, yeah. And, and like sin and things like yeah. that, yeah. Demonic possession. This is yeah, the time of the right. exorcist and yeah, all that okay. stuff. No, it had a terrible effect on me. It's, um, yeah, I think religion is just, a, you know, I can see why it's a consolation for people, but it shouldn't really have survived into the modern world. Mm. You know, I mean, I can see in the 14th century, <laughs> you, <were> being, <laughs> you know, roof on your hut or your stone walls, you know, food, and you'd have to go out and plough fields with a shovel. Why you think, God, there might be, there must be more than this, yeah. you know. But for most pampered people who live now, I mean, not everybody, obviously, but mm. for most people in the West, I don't know why you why you, you need it, really, you know. But, um, yeah, no, it had a bad effect on me, very bad. When you left school, what did you think you were going to do? Or did you ha want to do anything? <laughs> I didn't really want to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we about two months to go since no one had spoken to me about what my future might be. Yeah. Need no one at school, my parents. I thought, maybe, well, I suppose I should have to think about something mm. when I leave school in two months. So I thought, I'm good at art, so I'll apply to um, the art college, the NCAD. Mm. Of course, the application date had, you know, been the previous December. Right. <laughs> so that was one option closed yeah. off. So I heard about the College of Marketing and Design, so I thought I'd, they do art courses, graphic yeah. design. So I'll apply for that. M my goodness, the shoddiness of the, and the lack of preparation. It's mm. just kind of astonishing the way I drifted into it. Um, but yeah, I went to the College of Marketing and Design. Um, again, uh, I wish I'd applied myself more and take, taken it seriously, because now I do quite a lot of painting now, and, and I'm very interested in painting and art and stuff. But at the time, again, it was just shoddy, you know. Right. I mean, I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed my time there, but I could have made a lot more of it, you know. Mm. And then I was friends with Mick Nugent there, who was in the Students' Union, and he bizarrely persuaded me to stay on for another year and be treasurer. 
And okay. I can't, I literally can't count. Like, <laughs> I cannot, I can't do long division. <laughs> I know I was sick when they did long division at school, right, so I okay. don't know what it is. Okay. I know what the symbol of it is. Yeah. It's that line with the, I think there's a dot above yeah. and below it, but. It's good, it's a good start. That's a good start. But yeah, anyway, Mick, for 60 quid a week or something, I stayed on as treasure. And then that was, that brought me up to being 24. So then I think I did a bit of freelance illustration. Which was like nothing at yeah, all. I mean, right. Oh God. I remember going into hotels and saying, could I draw, maybe I could do it. You know, I'd been into hotels and seen pictures of paintings of yeah. the hotels in the hotel lobby. Yeah. So I had some notion I'd go into a hotel and ask, uh, could I see the manager? And uh, um, so I talked to someone who didn't know what the hell I was on about, like, you know. <laughs> And he said, I, I, the manager's too busy to see you today. So that was my career right. in painting. Um, and how often would you, did you do that? Well, I did it once. You did it once, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you considered the box <laughs> take, did you? I also had to paint coat, coats of arms. Okay. I think there's a name for that painting. It's mm. heraldry, I think, but there's mm. a name for painting. Right. And that was another f utterly futile ambition. And then I did... Would you describe an ambition as what you were doing with hotels? Like it wasn't... Well, it was something to do. Yeah. And I did, I did, a, I did a, um, it was the time when there were things called ankle courses, where the government would stick you on, on courses. Like I did a wall mural painting course. Okay. During which I spilt a massive, huge kind of black paint on the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> Like, it wasn't even outside, it was like inside. I don't know what I did. Did I fess up to it? I can't remember. And then I did a screen printing course okay. in Cabra. Uh, I did some I did some illustrations for the Sunday Tribune, which I couldn't get paid for. Like, mm -hmm. I just couldn't. I had to write them a solicitor's letter in the end to try and get paid. So that was like, there was 83, 84, 85, was that kind of stuff. And then I got into Hot Press. In eighty five, yeah, mm. and were you in like if you were if you were a worrier in general, were you worried about your where your no, life was going? No, was I should like, have. I mean, but, but it's bizarre looking back, but I should have been a bit more concerned, really. Maybe yeah. I was. I mean, it's a long time ago, so I can't really remember. Were other people concerned about it? Like, was your mother concerned about? Not it? as far as I knew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> she must have seen me around the house a bit more yeah. than was necessary, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's shoddy, you know, looking back, I think it's, God, that's shoddy and just directionless. But um, I suppose you are direction, like, you know, lots of people are directionless. Yeah, most there. people, yeah. I mean, I never really made a decision about my life. I kind of drifted along into things and, yeah. you know, met the right people. Yeah. Uh, which brought me to where I am today. But it's a failing with me that I don't, you know, I don't make decisions you know I just drift along it's a failing but you tend to be like you know just going back to what you're you know you have on at the moment like you you're, you're very prolific in some ways like you've a lot going on like we have we'll come to this again but you have this yeah. book is just said notes from a lost lost tribe with Declan Lynch yeah. like you've you know yeah I'm quite prolific and I'm quite fast at doing stuff but I wasted so much time when I was younger that I'm and when I'm not I'm either writing or painting really and that's what I do during the day. Um, and I'm prone to reclusiveness. So it's good to get out. Like, so when you ask me to do yeah. this, yeah, I better do that to get out of the house. <laughs> it's, <right. Okay. laughs> it's great. I was so glad that's and the you reason. you told me that you'd been at home for, <laughs> what, 25 years? For 15 years. I worked at home <laughs> for 15 years. So it's yeah. actually good to get out. So it it's is, a bit yeah. scary, you know, <laughs> but it is definitely good to meet, uh, to meet other people because I'm not gregarious you know I'm no. not a gregarious person and how did you find that when you went and we were jumping ahead a bit and we might jump back but when you went to London and you were in uh, like a kind of a media world mm. like did you find how did you find your personality adapted to that um, I don't know did it adapt I mean it was weird we, we I Graham Lennon who I knew in Hot Press was quite ambitious about writing comedy and he decided to go to London mm. to write for Select magazine. Um, and he said, do you want to come for a few months? So I'd been in Hot Press a while and for certain other reasons I, I left Hot Press. 
Uh, I had a great time in Hot Press. The good people. Mm. And still some of my best friends, including Declan Lynch, who we both know very well. Um, but I, although I knew Declan before I was in Hot Press. Mm. But anyway, I, met, I moved to London and we started writing sketches. We sent them into Smith and Jones and we met the script editor there. And before too long, like I'd gone back, I thought I'd go for a few months to London and then come back. But then when I returned to Ireland, I got a call from Graham said, oh, Mel and Griff want us to go into these script meetings. Mm. So suddenly I found myself in Percy Street in Soho uh, in Talkback, Mel and Griff's production company. And we were, I just, you know, I was a big fan of Mel and Griff through not the nine o'clock news and Smith and Jones. And suddenly we were just around the table with Mel and Griff, you know. And they brought in a coffee pot, you know, the ones you press the thing yeah. down on. And I'd never seen one of these before. <laughs> I remember <laughs> trying to pour the coffee without pressing okay. the thing down. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, Jesus, I must, I must appear very foolish. But they were very. It was, it was a real meritocracy in England. Yeah. That you know anyone could send in sketches, and we did. And before mm. we knew it, we were there. And, and Mel and Griff were really good, to, especially Griff who we were closer to, because we lived, he had loads, as he got richer and richer, he got all these houses that he's accumulated. Yeah. And he <coughs> won, won in Kilburn, where we uh, we lived in his house in Kilburn. We played rent, but, mm. paid rent, but he was very good to us. I remember going out with his wife to buy like cutlery and plates and stuff for in, in Ladbroke Grove or mm. somewhere. And Griff would be walking ahead of us, me and Graham and Joe, Griff's wife, but then we'd see that people would be coming towards Griff and pretending not to notice him. But then once they'd passed, they'd say, that's Griff, he's Jones. <laughs> so that was the first, um, what it was like to be famous, you know. And Griff was very, very famous at the time. But were you working then, you were, were you working somewhere and like Steve Coogan was working, writing in the yeah, same building and stuff? Back, yeah, Talkback, yeah. Um, yeah, Coogan was there, Chris Morris, Amanda Minucci. Um, and we wrote, they see the first thing I when, I when I went to London, we didn't even have a television. Um, I remember even considering buying a black and white television. Really? <laughs> yes, <laughs> berserk. After all your years trying to yeah. get away from black and white television, berserk. Oh, Graham, let you know this one. We get one for twenty quid or something. Yeah. But anyway, we didn't. It was just bizarre. But we had a radio, and I turned on the radio, and there was a show called On the Hour, mm. which was Chris Morris's radio show with Coogan and Armando. And all those people. And it was brilliant because I didn't know it was a spoof radio show. And so it was done so realistically. Mm. I thought, is this real? And then you realise it's not. Yeah. So that was like the first night I was in London, I think. And then we, within a year or something, we got to know all those yeah. people. Um, and we wrote a sketch for the day to day, which is the TV version of On the Hour. We just wrote yeah. one small thing for that. What was that? It was about a noise, a flat that was very noisy and the neighbours complained about it and the police had their way of dealing with this and that they'd bring a tiger and set it into the flat, they'd just throw it into the flat. So we wrote that and it's, then you suddenly see, wow, they've actually, someone's got a tiger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they've actually filmed this and they've got a tiger and like, you know, with all the, the you know, the, the difficulties of having to hire a tiger. But so they did that, you know. I mean, that I think that's the only sketch we did for for the day to day. But we 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 got to know them a bit, you know. They were all all that, those people. They were either kind of Catholics or Jewish, funnily enough. Yeah. Um, and Coogan is a great, a huge Irish background as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. He was going to do um, at one stage as a character in Father Ted that John Kenny played in the Eurovision uh, one where off stage he's like very um rough mm. and can hardly speak and very um ruffled looking but once he goes on stage he's completely smooth and that i think that character was was based on someone coogan knew he was going to play that oh, role. really right. yeah but he didn't in the end and john kenny was very good but he yeah coogan had some relative in iron i think that kind of spoke in a way that was completely <laughs> not understandable. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Coogan, yeah, he's kind of, yeah. 
So you were kind of surrounded, like you talked about Graham being very ambitious for the writing and stuff. Was that what you would say you were fortunate to come in contact with people? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I was, you know, I, I knew Declan and I knew Tony Clayton Lee and because they were friends of mine and that's how I got into Hot Press. Mm. I remember doing the interview at Hot Press with Niall Stokes and Maureen, his wife, and they asked me, because the, the, we did production weekends, which was really hard work and very intensive. Mm. And they actually asked me, Niall asked me, have you ever actually done that kind of hard work, really hard work? And I answered, I honestly answered, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> you still gave me the job. <laughs> <laughs> I still got the job when I was, I said, no, I've actually never done any hard work. I don't know what, it, I don't know what it would be like. <laughs> but I'm, I'm ready to give it a go. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll give it a go. So yeah, so thanks Niall for you know giving me the job. And then I met Graham and other people. and. Still friends of mine, yeah. But then you were like, what was Hot Press like as a kind of breeding ground for your creativity? Because, like, oh, I was great, it was yeah. really good. And uh, there were some, a lot of people there. The first people ever, I, first time ever, I kind of thought, well, there's a lot of people here who I can relate to, and they've got the same outlook and sense of humour and just sense of fun, really, mm. and stuff like that. And Paul Woodfull, of course, came in, and Paul and I were kind of soulmates there. Um, so they were great, and Graham, Noel was very good at discovering talent, like, mm. you know, like even someone like Neil Jordan come through Hot Press. Mm. And um, so Graham, yeah, Graham, Damien Corliss uh, was teaching at some college where Graham was repeating his leaving. So Graham, he just got Graham into right, and that's where I met Graham. Um, and you would do that. You do the border fascist. Yeah, I mean, I was doing layout. I wasn't yeah. doing writing. Um, but yeah, I did the border fascist and just um, and odd, stupid stuff. Yeah, Charles, Charles J. Charles, 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 yeah. yeah. What was that? Believe it or not, that was what was it? It was like Ripley's Believe It or Not, but presented by Charles J. Hawley. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds. And really I did actually. Weird. Damon Carlos the other day sent me something I'd done, which was the 25th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. But it was like an in depth look at that, but blaming. Johnny Giles and the Man United <laughs> 1963 FA Cup winning squad right. as being part of the plot <laughs> and that they were all in the grassy knoll and stuff. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so I did kind of stupid. So Niall, you know, Niall was great and let me do that kind of stuff. And uh, even though I mean, the, the for, one of the first few things I did when I was laying out hot press was in those days you'd have long strips of text and you just paste it down and like I remember clearly just it came back from the printers and I'd, I'd laid out the text completely in the wrong order. <laughs> it's right. terrible. Well, he must have been furious, but he's a gentleman really, Niall, and he was never, he never berated me over that. So, you know, he was, he, was, he let me just write stupid stuff there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and so then if we, you, so by the time you follow Graham to London then and you're writing, but like Ted then, like jump back again, like the ideas for Ted, you mentioned that you had relations who were, yeah. were priests, like was yeah. this something that was kind of swirling around in your head? Um, well, I mean, Ted came about because while we were in Talkback, we were, we had this idea called Irish Lives, which was like six, it was like a mock doc style, which was big at the time. Uh, of six Irish lives and like, I, I can't even remember what most of them were, but one of them was a priest who'd, who decided to check up on all the other priests who'd been in the seminary with. And that was, uh, we sent that off to Hattrick Productions. And then I think they said, yeah, we like this idea, but making it into a sitcom, because if it's a sitcom, you can, ju you can just do loads of series of it and you can keep going. So that mm. was where the character came from. Well, actually, no, in, in the Joshua Trio, which was the band I was in with Paul, yeah. um, I, I did the character, Father Ted Crilly, who'd come along before the, the gig and just say, just introduce the band and stuff. So that's what the character was. And he had a, fr he had a friend called Father Dougal Maguire, but that's all it was. But then we just developed them. Yeah, we just developed them and, and sent them to Hattrick, and that's how that happened. The Joshua Trio, that was, like that at the time, like you two were so huge when you did the Joshua Trio. Was it kind of subversive? Yeah, not like now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they were kind of, the, you know, they were almost like, they, they were, 
There was they were the orthodoxy like lo, like you two seem to speak with a kind of great authority in Ireland at that time, and they were well, you know you might have thought so. Yeah, well, the kind of official kind of view on you two was that wasn't? Would you not think? think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I never you know I I think you two are f just fantastic live act, mm. and like I've. I've got a few other live DVDs and I stick them on late at night yeah. and, and watch them and they're great but I don't really have any records by them or CDs by them and like they were involved in kind of Christian groups and stuff like that yeah. and I thought that's just odd and and I, I think The Edge is fantastic guitarist but I just I never thought Bono particularly had any great insight into anything and like mm. when he'd come out with this stuff it was obviously for people of cynical minded like me, I just thought it was kind of funny a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, I think Bono does have a sense of humour, but, you know, it's just at the time it just seemed rather pompous mm. and, and, you know, and it's hard to take seriously, really, you know. And Paul and myself used to find that stuff hilarious. So it was just... Um, so there was an audience for the Joshua Trio then? There was a huge yeah, audience yeah, for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> we used to play upstairs and to bag it in. And you'd see queues outside yeah. from, you know, all over the world. Right. But um, I think they were kind of... Yeah, we got a signed message from, from you. I don't think McGuinness ever liked it. But I think the, they couldn't... Like Bono yeah. and the, they couldn't care less about me. Why, you know, they, we, they signed a photograph to us and that. Right. I mean, you know, I... Um, there were some. There were something for the country to be proud of you two, because mm. they weren't naff. You know, they were. They were. Bono was a bit that stuff I could never take seriously. But they were a damn good live band and made some very good records. You know, I think at that time, I think more people took them seriously than they do now. Maybe, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. funny because I just yeah, never, never, did. No, no. <laughs> never took them that seriously. But having you know, I never criticise people unless I see them as a higher status to myself, yeah. and that I would willingly swap places with them. So yeah, I'd <laughs> rather be Bono. Having I'd never criticise anyone mm. unless I swap places with them. So yeah, I'd rather be Bono than me. And uh, he, you know, he's done he's done well. Mm. So um, so you had the Ted Crilly character then from that. Yeah. And how did that develop then? Well, we just rode into a sitcom, and where does he live? Mm. He lives in some isolated parish, and who does he live with? He lives with a kind of simple-minded younger priest and an elderly, um, troublesome priest mm. and the housekeeper. They're a family, you know. Yeah. It's like the father, mother, and the two kids, really. Um, you know, it's kind of basic stuff. It's not, it's not too clever. Like, you know, the Dougal character, every sitcom seemed to have a an idiot in it, like Manuel and Faulty Towers or Trigger and Only Fields and mm. Horses, you know, it's not, it's not, to use probably the term I hate more than anything in the world, it's not rocket science. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or who did some one fo uh, football pundit once said, it's not rocket surgery. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. But apparently I also read rocket science as one of the, e one of the uh, um, more difficult Sciences, right? Okay. Or, or no, easiest, sorry, no. It is easy, one of the easiest, easiest sciences. sciences. Yeah, so. it's one of the easiest sciences. <laughs> okay, well, then. but yeah, I hate it's such. La it's so lazy when people say. It. The other thing I used to hate was when people say it, something's on acid, like you know, yeah. it's like Gary Lineker on acid. Yeah. Like I hate that lazy way of speaking. But anyway, Father Ted is is not complicated. But was the the writing of it? I heard you saying before that there was very little improvisation from the cast yeah. and like did you plot it all out yeah. quite meticulously and all the writing? Yeah we used to do like 10, 1 to 10 where it'd start off and then where it'd end up mm. but that was secondary like the most mostly we just think it's bizarre situations for them or um, you know just anything at all like there was like we had an idea where Ted has a car and he just, there's a little scratch or dent in it and he decides to just try to get rid of it by tapping it with a hammer. Mm. Then you cut to that, cut to later and the whole car is destroyed. So that, those ideas would come first and then you'd slot them in. Mm. And it was surprisingly easy to do, to slot any kind of mad idea into a plot, you know. Mm. But the plotting, you, you, you do have to tell a story, that's all it is. It's telling a story and you have to go on some kind of to use another word I hate, journey, mm. to, and end up, you know, 
you have to even it's, it's a very short show it's only 23 minutes or something but you have to tell a little story and but you hang all the jokes on that you know but all the stuff that like the 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 comedy that came from priests being involved in kind of day-to-day -day life which was one of the great you know that thing that you would have observed even yeah. as a kid well, like the, well the idea in ted was which was really handy for sitcom was the idea that every priest in the world knew every other priest in the world <laughs> And I got that impression growing up, because yeah. two of my uncles were priests, and I got the impression they knew every priest, mm. maybe not in the world, but in Ireland. And my uncle Tom, who I was very fond of, and he was the youngest, my other older uncle priest, he'd stayed in Ireland, he was quite conservative. Uncle Tom had gone off to, to um, England, and he was in Birmingham. And uh, he... Um, He'd always bring priests to the house, and like mm. a lot of them, it seemed to be a lot of them recovering from strokes and that sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, and the way they chat about yeah. other priests and yeah. how old would he? What, what age would he be now? That was a common kind. Mm. How old would he be now? Would he be seventy? I suppose he would. So I picked up that a lot and put that in. Uh, was there something about a priest saying mass in a car? At some, was there something? Yeah, my uncle Tom. Yeah, he did say mass in a car. Um, because I was, he used to come home and say my mother's anniversary mass every mm. year. And uh, this time he couldn't say it in another uncle's house. Uh, so he had nowhere to say it really. But um, <laughs> I was flying out from Dublin airport yeah. to London. He was flying in okay. to visit some nuns down in Wax Wexford, I think. Right. So he was stuck for a place to say the mass. So he said, I'll just say it in the car. I'll, I'm hiring the car in the airport. So he just say it, say it in the car. So true enough, we went off to Avis, rent a car or something, and he he was in the front, and me and my, my sister were in the back, and he just said the mass in the, the front seat. He got the stuff out the back, right. the, the chalice and that, and the little silver box, and he said that we were looking at him in the mirror. Okay. That was, <laughs> that was bizarre. Was and all these people would pass, like, you know, <laughs> pilots and people who would pass the car while he was saying mass. And was it a, a fast mass? It was, it? It was yeah. really fast, yeah. yeah. There was a small sermon about right. my mother but yeah. it was he must have brought it in under 10 minutes really, that's, yeah that was all i remember someone on our road they had an uncle who was a priest and his thing was the fast mass when he came to yeah. stay yeah and he'd come and stay with them and he'd do it in under 10 minutes in their sitting room yeah and the people would kind of look on enviously yeah 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 no the, the people used to I, I think i read that when cars people started driving cars they'd use them to go to another parish with a shorter mass yeah. <laughs> But, um, well, that that was Ireland, you know. That was that was the way it was. Yeah, it was a theocracy, and you know it was. Let's face it. Yeah. it was, it was run by the church, and um, simpler days, yeah. And when Ted was a success, then, like, how did that take you by surprise, or what did that mean to for you? Well, it was it was good, but it was a gradual build. Like it wasn't an overnight yeah. thing. I think the first, we'd done a series with Lexi Sale beforehand, which wasn't a success. But with this, someone someone from the Independent in London, um, very shortly after the first episode was broadcast, got in touch with us. And so that was kind of a sign that he said he liked it. So mm. that was a kind of sign that people liked it. But I mean, I don't think it got particularly good reviews or anything in the Did first series. No, not really. In Ireland, especially not in Ireland, I think. Jane Kerrigan gave a pretty bad review. I think he said, um, well, apparently Darren Morgan hasn't written this and it shows. <laughs> okay. And then there was some other <coughs> priest did a classic thing in the Irish press, I think, where he said, uh, I can't remember his name, he says, um, he says uh, I didn't think it was bad, I just didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> it was that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It got a lukewarm response, I don't know. But it, it just seemed to take off then after, mm. after the second series, third series. Um, but it was gradual, so, you know, it was a gradual thing. And was there a kind of a celebrity attached to it? Like, were you, you were, go going to, were you going to, like, the Groucho Club and places like that? I was for a bit, yeah. yeah. Or how did you find that? It was just bizarre. I mean, I think one of the first times you we went to the Groucho Club, there was a man lying on the ground, surrounded by these beautiful women who were trying to, you know, haul him back up. And it was Oliver Reed. <laughs> right. <laughs> That must have been great. Like, it must have been hilarious to be observing those things. Yeah, I mean, it was great. And I saw, I remember seeing Paul McCartney down there. Yeah. I 
made eye contact with Paul McCartney. But you know, uh, I was you know I was in my thirties when this was happening, so uh, you know it's great to to meet mm. these people without a doubt. Um, yeah, and uh, you go to Griff's house and Angus Deaton, people would be there. But they were always very nice to us, you know, really, really accepting and, and uh, just very nice to us, you know, really. Um, it was great, yeah, they were mm. really good to us, yeah, it's brilliant. And you had a friendship with John Peel as well, did you? Yeah, How we did have a friendship with John yeah. Peel because I'd written a book, Well Remembered Days. Which is a fantastic book. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, I lo I, it's great when people mention that to me, but my literary agent was in Talkback. She, there was an agency in Talkback, yeah. a literary agent. And Peel was one of our clients, so uh, yeah, we used to go for 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 lunch with Peel a bit. And right. he's a very open person. Yeah. You know, he'd written, he'd sent us a postcard saying how much he liked Father Ted. Okay. And he said, "Have a look at the postcard." And it was from Crouch End, and there's four scenes of Crouch End, and one of them was Banners Cafe, vegetarian restaurant. Crouch end and Peel said, "Look at the closely at the picture," and he was in the picture. Peel was actually in it. <laughs> okay, just completely right. coincidental. Right. But he wrote to us out of the yeah. blue and said, "I really like your show," and then we used to occasionally meet him for lunch. And then this is the be this is the most humbling moment ever, right? Mm. Uh, he did a show called A Good Read, I think, with Matthew Paris, where you select your favorite book, and he selected Well Remembered really? Days. And I thought, wow, that it's genuinely kind of humbling yeah. moment. But it is, it is a fantastic book. Well, like, thanks I mean, very like much. People yeah, should I mean, check I, it out because I it's enjoyed. Uh, uh, I certainly enjoyed doing it. But yeah, we we met Matt Peel, and then uh, um, well, I remember going to a sixtieth birthday party down in where he lived, down in where is it Sussex. Um, and yeah, then he was an Ipswich, became an Ipswich fan. He became an Ipswich. Yeah. He was a big Liverpool yeah. fan, but he did go and see the Tractor Boys. Mm. And uh, yeah, and then of course the next time we went to his funeral there. Um, mm. So yeah, but we used. To, he was a lovely, but legendary for you know. I remember when I was in Dublin in about seventy eight, he was going to come over to the Project Art Centre, and it was like, it was like it was as big as like the Stones right. coming over or yeah. something. He was a huge celebrity. But I got I read his book, uh, or Dave Kavanagh's book, this journalist wrote a book about where he selects various playlists from John Peel's show over the years, from the sixties and the seventies, the punk year right up. Mm. And the the playlist is is a starting off point for the art. But one of the playlists he has is the Declan tell you this, the sta the um Static Routines, Declan's band. Really? It's on the playlist, yeah. He's, it's mentioned. Wow, he knew Declan yeah. never mentioned that. To he's me. very modest. <laughs> he is very modest. But, he um, yeah, so he knew Peel a bit. Not terribly well, but he was one of these people who just was very interested in, in other people and had no pretensions at all of, despite his fame, mm. absolutely none at all. Absolutely none at all. But that was a thrill. I mean, I never, I listened to his show a bit. To be honest, I found a lot of it, of his show pretty hard going. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the punk thing, but the kind of, the rock and roll aspect of it, like the Ramones and the Sex Pistols mm -hmm. and the, the Rosillos and people, but I just, I really just like the kind of post-punk grim stuff like right. Joy Division and The Fall and all that. Okay. So with, with Peel, there was no rhyme or reason at all to what he liked. Yeah. It was just all over the place, you know, there was no there was no um logic to it at all. But anyway, that was that was Peel and uh, he was great. It was it was brilliant to meet him, yeah. And you were living in London then, were you? Or were you yeah. back and forth? Well I was always back and forth a bit, but right. I was certainly based in London. We lived in Griff's house for a bit, then I moved out and moved to Battersea and Stratham and I ended up in Barnes, yeah. which is very nice. Yeah. Gary Lineker lives there. He does live yeah. there, and I used to. Yeah. Uh, Lee Dixon lives there. Does he? Yeah, and I used to see Tra Peter Bowles. <laughs> right. Jar no, Jarvis didn't live there, but I did see him at the Barnes Fair. Um, Trevor McDonald, I'd see around. Okay. Yeah, it's very leafy. Yeah. But no one kind of knows about because it it's not on the tube lines. Right. Yeah. But have you been? Have you been to Barnes? I have been to Barnes. Yeah. 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 I lived in London for. Yeah, I know a you did. Time. Yeah. Where did so you live in London? Yeah. Kensal Green. Kensal Green, right. Kensal Rise, yeah. yeah. Well, Barnes is very nice. It's, a, yeah. um, it's got a pond. 
Yeah, it has lovely. We went, I went back there because there was a kids' book festival there. Right. So I brought my daughter and Faith, my partner. Another word I hate, my partner. So we went to that, which was good fun. Yeah. And that, how long did you, when did you come back then? I came back in Maud. My daughter was born in 2010. I just sold up by a flat in Barnes. Okay. But it was very small. And I had an awful nightmare neighbour. I used to play the Lighthouse family and Elton John right. really loudly. Yeah. So he was a nightmare. So I wasn't, you know, I was, although he had moved out a few months before I sold up. Mm. <laughs> but, yeah, I didn't, again, I didn't make the most of living in London. Um, I should have got fully involved in the community. And what community? I didn't really. The, the Barnes, Barnes community. community. With Lee Dixon and Trevor <laughs> MacDonald. Where were they, where were they Lee going? Lee Dixon and yeah. Trevor MacDonald. Um, but I didn't, you know, I, I, you know, I'm one of these people, you know, you meet people and you see them interviewed and they say, do you have any regrets? And they all say, none at all. Yeah. It's brought me to where I am today. I wouldn't change a thing. Whereas I change practically <laughs> everything. Right. Things I could have done better or... But is that just yeah. your nature and should you really... Like maybe yeah. regretting stuff is, is part of that nature too, but like... Well, I should have changed my nature. Maybe right. I don't like my nature very much. Yeah. Yeah, if I had my time all over again, I'd do lots of things differently, definitely. And what, but, but like, even things like getting engaged, with, you know, what does that mean? Like, what do you think? You could have gone to the theatre more in London or you could have done... No, no, I did all things. that. Yeah, yeah. No, I did. In fact, I'm brilliant in London because I go, yeah. I do go to lots of things. Yeah. I go to, like, lots of places like National Portrait Gallery, mm. um, all those places. I do all that. And I've got probably as many friends in London as I do here. And when I do go over... Um, I meet up with them, yeah. like, you know, and um, I have some really good friends there. I ended up recently with it's a friend of mine called Bridget Nichols, um, who used to live in Barnes, and she's, she's, um, she organises the pe festival, which is like insect festivals, okay. which is really interesting, but she's, she knows everybody, and I admire this, because mm. she's an extrovert, and I'm an introvert, so I mm. admire people who are extroverts, mm. and she said, oh, you must meet, um, we'd go for dinner, I've, well, you must meet DBC Pierre, because mm. I know DBC, he'd love to meet you. So I ended up, and then there was another well, another friend of hers who was Lady something, mm. who, who owned a massive house, she'd married into some very posh family, she was probably quite posh, she was, she was lovely. Yeah. So I went for dinner in the Polish club in South Kensington, and we went there because like it's one that like it's you can there's a terrace so you can smoke yeah. so everyone could smoke. I don't smoke, but anyway they closed that off because you know even even if you're beside a park you're not allowed to smoke now in London. Mm. But DBC Pierre and these other people right. were uh, tremendous fun and yeah. old fashioned drinkers and smokers yeah, yeah. and all that and just tremendous fun. And so that's a great that's a great night out mm. in London like you know. But I just, when I say I just spent too much time in the, I mean, I was always going back to Dublin anyway. But I should have just joined. I always have this thing now, a thing recently, I think. I must join some painting group. Right. And start, you know, become part of that community. And I, there's an artist called Edward Bodden and someone called Eric Revillius, and they lived in this kind of community in, in Essex in the 30s and 40s. And they're fantastic artists. So I went to, we went to England. We uh, spent a lot of just holidaying in England. Mm. We went to see where they, this this small this small village called Great Bardfield. So I went there, you know. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm just very interested in painting these days. Um, but what Barnes, I should have probably just just hung out. I mean, I did. I, there was a there's a Bull's Head pub. And the residencies like Humphrey Little and used to play right, there regularly. Yeah, yeah. Alan Price played there regularly because okay. he lives in Barnes as well. And Alan Price's show is just brilliant, yeah. and it's like one of Europe's oldest jazz pubs. But I should have hung out there and get getting chatting to the locals, which I should never do. But really. That sounds completely alien to you that you would sit there chatting, chatting to the chatting locals. Yeah, it is. Locals. But I should have done it <laughs> <laughs> if you were someone completely different. Yeah, there's lots of things that are completely alien to me that I should have done, yeah. without a doubt. You know, I should have reinvented myself. <laughs> I probably should have gone to London. 
when instead of stay, stay in Dublin after I finished college, I probably should have gone. But it would have been a very traumatic <laughs> experience yeah. for me, you know. But it seems to me like you, as you said, like meeting Graham and getting that, that somebody who had that ambition. Cause you, you, would you say you've had much ambition for yourself? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Be, I wouldn't be doing writing, comedy writing, unless I'd met Graham without doubt. I just yeah, wouldn't be doing yeah. it. Again, it's an example of who you meet along the way, mm. like you know. Um, so, I'm very grateful to Graham mm. that you know because I ended up with. Um, it suits my personality, and you know you make a comfortable enough living. It just kind of suits me, you know. Yeah. It definitely suits me to do this kind of thing, you know. And um, when you came back, did you did you find it difficult to be back here all no, the time? No, see, I was always back and forth yeah, anyway, yeah. you know. So no, I mean, um, um, yeah, I've always just gone between the two, you know. Mm. But you, I mean, you, you know what it's like as well because yeah. you lived in London. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it's fascinating. I, I'm fascinated by by England, mm. you know. Yeah. And places in England and their football teams and yeah. the history and I mm. mean like any sport worth a damn has come from England. Mm. Like anything that's yeah. any good has come from England and uh, music. They're incredible, really, you know. So I'm a, an Anglophile without doubt, and it's completely. It'd be impossible to imagine Ireland without England. Yeah, I mean, impossible. You just couldn't. I mean, and I imagine if you're, if you come from Siberia and you're planted in Dublin, you wouldn't see much difference between that and if you're planted in Wolverhampton or mm. Sheffield or anywhere. You know, it's just Marks and Spencers and Tesco's and. There were some people who would kind of find that objectionable. The yeah, fact I that know. you. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are. Yeah, yeah. But I don't. I think they're. Yeah, I know. I know people who would like embrace their ethnicity mm. or whatever but I, I I've i kind of rejected everything I grew up with, like religion and nationalism and I've just but I, I'm very um, um, I like to kick against the grain mm. or whatever it is mm. and when when did you first reject nationalism like when when did I first <laughs> reject nationalism <laughs> <laughs> that sounded much more pompous than I intended. When did you? When did you first? When did you? Did you ever feel nationalistic? Oh God, yeah, did yeah. You? Everyone did. It was part of the, the yeah. genetic makeup of the country. Catholicism and nationalism. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with nationalism, but I is just, there not? Well, no, not really. But I just think the kind of, like, I don't think having read a lot about it. I don't think the revolution from 1916 was really necessary. Really, I think we would have ended up where we are mm. anyway. It would have taken a longer time. But I think for all the utter chaos and misery that I caused, it wasn't worth it, you know? Mm. I mean, I became a Republican in 1948, 49, which might, might have kind of happened anyway. Yeah. I mean, it was a slower process, but you wouldn't have had... You, know, you might have had the theocracy war. either. Well, I d yeah, you might have. You might, you might, you might have thought that they wouldn't have, have had as much power. Mm. Yeah, you might you might have had a welfare state. Mm. And Gareth Fitzgerald used to say that it's because him being an Irish nationalist, he thought it was good the revolution happened when it did, because if there had been a welfare state in Ireland and Britain, mm. and part of Irish independence would have been to go back to a non-welfare yeah. state, that it would have been harder to sell the Irish independent republic to people. Mm. But um, no, I like reading. I, I'm not really that interested in Irish culture, as in like music or the GA or whatever. But I do. The Irish, the history of the country mm. is incredible. And people like Kevin O'Higgins are incredible. And the lives they led yeah. are quite astonishing. And Collins and people. You did say, I, when you were on Twitter, you, uh, you apologised for um, the GA jerseys that were in <laughs> Paris. During oh, yeah, 2016, yeah, uh, yeah jerseys like visual, kind of po visual pollution of this. Well, yeah, city. I mean, yeah, let's face it, they're not very good. When you fly into Dublin Airport Terminal 2, they're all lined up <laughs> on the wall as well. So, that do you enjoy that? You enjoy seeing that? Oh, I love it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. They'll be up forever as well. Yeah, there's no chance of them ever being taken down. 
And you, the GAA never was never something that appealed to you. No, I could never really take it seriously. A bit like you too. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh, they're rugby posts, but they've got soccer nets on them. And yeah. they're like 15 goalkeepers. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that makes me very popular in the country. Yeah. But no, it's, I, no. I just, no, not at When all, you say no. you don't like Irish culture and stuff like that. I do well, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm very aware. Of, I grew up and I'm, I'm very. Yeah, yeah. Completely immersed in mm. it. But well, you'll have to defend yourself. It's not yourself. like I hate it or I, it's just like, you know, I was watching Top of the Pops. That's your well, cult. That's well, what you grew up with. It's part yeah, of your culture. Yeah, you know, I was watching. You no, know, you can, you can have, you know, when you see T Rex get it on, you think that's yeah. no, pretty good. You yeah. know, it's maybe a bit more interesting than, or not, not even interesting, but it appeals to be more than Planksty or something. Mm. You know, but it's just a matter of taste. Yeah. You know, but I was going to ask you about Irish politics and British politics, especially as you're doing something on Brexit, because you in. 2009, you said there was something funnier in Irish politics than yeah. in British politics. Yeah. And I was wondering if that has changed with Maybe Brexit. It has. Yeah. Like, has more Egetry infected kind of British politics or, or whatever their version of Egetry is? Yeah, it's hard to see their version of Egetry in British politics where it was, it was always uh, true of Irish. But the Eurosceptics seem to me, whatever their version is, like, they seem to be full of. Uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of comical, like, yeah, I mean, Farage is a kind of a stereotype. Mm. Um, it's chaos, really, the Brexit thing. Um, but I don't have, I kind of understand where they're coming from. I mean, I would have voted Remain, but I don't have a, um, disdain for them like a lot of people have of the Brexit ears, you know. Okay. But not that I'm, st I, I feel, you're kind of, even if you say that, you're drifting into <laughs> <laughs> into, into a, being labelled a racist or something. <laughs> but, but what do you mean you don't have to... In what, in, you understand what they... Yeah, I know what they're coming from. Right. I know what their attitude is to Europe and to... I know what they're coming from. I don't agree with... I mean, I'm... You know, I don't particularly like nationalism and I think, you know, essentially Brexit... Brexiteers are, are nationalistic, yeah. you know. Um but I don't. I I do know where they're coming from. I don't dismiss them like a lot of people would. You know. And if coming from in what sense, in regards to the EU being a, some a sort of undemocratic um, kind of state, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I don't know enough about, it and yeah. I'm not agreeing with them. But I know where all I say is I know I know where they're coming from. Mm. You know. But even saying that, I feel <laughs> like I should, I should kill myself. <laughs> I, I think that's okay. Having defended Brexiteers <laughs> Arthur and, Matthews and, and Donald Trump supporters. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, you've, you've done well. Too, yeah. yeah, good job I'm still not on Twitter. <laughs> Why did you leave Twitter? Well, you know, it's too easy. Well, you know, um, it's too easy to say the wrong thing and mm. end up with your life in ruins. Yeah. <laughs> like I read like, something like in Britain this like, how, how loads of policemen spend all their time looking at right. Twitter, looking out for, you know, hate crime. Yeah. <laughs> or just like 3,000 people, I think, somewhere got, the police got in contact with about something that said on Twitter. Yeah. It's too easy, like, you know, if you're, if you're waiting for a flight in Dublin airport and Aer Lingus has been delayed for two hours and it's mm. too easy to go on, fuck you, Aer Lingus. Yeah. It's too easy to do that. And I just think... Yeah, I think it was just, a, it's some people, I mean, some people could go on Twitter, say you're inter interested in basket weaving, mm -hmm. you could just follow other people who are yeah. interested in basket weaving. It should be okay. Yeah, but mm -hmm. not many people can do that, they get involved. And other things, like you now know people's politics, whereas before you wouldn't. Mm. Like there's a, this, um, a BBC programme called... Uh, um, uh, where they what's it called? They look up old pictures and see what they're what they're they're if they're worth anything. Oh yeah. The public bring it to them. Antiques Roadshow. No, 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 not Antiques Roadshow. No, it's not. No, it's uh, it's if Fiona Bruce does it. Oh um, yeah, I know. The, I know the one. one. Yeah, but yeah. there's another one, a spin-off of this. Yeah. Anyway, there's this academic on it called Doctor Bendor Grosvenor, right? Mm. And I thought, well, you know, picture restoration and interestingly, maybe Tory kind of. Mm. He's called. 
Dr. Bender Grosvenor. And then I realised on Twitter he was fiercely anti-Brexit and very pro-Remain. Mm. So, which is fine. I mean, mm. I'd be I'd be like that. Yeah. But now you know people's politics, yeah. you know, and maybe it's better off if you don't know people's politics. Because you see what's happening in America and Britain to a degree as well. Mm. Um, it's just, but it's too easy to get in trouble and say the wrong thing and offend people. And then, mm. then you're in a, a a Twitter storm with you say something and then someone bites back and then it's a, you know, it's just. Did ugly. you have that? Did you have that? Did no, you, I didn't. Did you, yeah. Once or twice, but very little, you know, but I just thought it, it's, it's, it's better if I don't go on it, you mm. know. Um, I could do just follow other people who are interested in basket weaving. Yeah, but then I'd have to develop an interest in basket weaving. Yeah. What can you tell us about Pope Ted? Um, well, um, it's written first draft. Yeah. The music in it is fantastic. I can tell you that. Yeah. Neil Hannon, Paul Woodfull. Uh, it's brilliant. It's like really good. Mm. So, but because it doesn't exist. The music exists, so right. I can say what that's yeah, like. Yeah. But because the show doesn't exist yet, I don't know. I mean, I I'm presuming it'd be good. Yeah, <laughs> well, have you written? You've written? You've written? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's written as a first draft, but right, it, okay. it will change. It's really Graham's project, really. He's driving the whole. Unlike okay. the TV series, which was very fifty-fifty, he's driving this really. But I've done, I've done quite a lot of work on it. Uh, yeah, it's probably better not to talk too much about it yet because it doesn't exist. Yeah, what do you mean by it doesn't exist? It doesn't exist. Well, it, it doesn't exist as a thing. It's not. It hasn't been put up on stage right. in front of people. Yeah, you know, and it'll change a lot. Musicals, I think, particularly change a lot. And um, but it's about Ted becoming Pope. Yeah, yeah. That it's in it, the clue is in the title. <laughs> <laughs> no, I sort of that that hasn't changed. Like that hasn't. No, that's yeah. still what it's about. I mean, they yeah. Graham doesn't like really revealing too much about okay. it. Um, he's very secretive about it. Uh, but but honestly, the music is, is it blows me away really. Um, and it's not like, I mean, I do like musicals. Like I've always gone to see musicals. Mm. Uh, but like the modern music, I I think the last great musical was like in the, like Oliver probably in the sixties. Like I don't, I'm not a fan of the modern music. Did you see the Book of Mormon or anything? Oh, we did see yeah, that. Yeah. We did see that, and that's brilliant. Yeah, that's very good. It's very funny. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's much sillier than I thought it would be, and uh, yeah, that's terrific. Yeah. But some of the modern stuff, like Wicked, for example, like uh, if you ever listen to Elaine Page's show on <laughs> on BBC Radio Two, where she plays lots of songs, she's great. Mm. Elaine Page and Johnny Rotten's book, one of his autobiographies. He went in jukebox jury, mm. and everyone was horrible to him except Elaine Page. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she was really nice, to him. <laughs> and uh, she does this show, and she plays lots of musicals, stuff from musicals, but kind of a lot of modern stuff like mm. Wicked, and I just think it's a bit bland, really, you know. Mm. But um, anyway, the music in this is just terrific. Um, how have you found fatherhood? Well, I had such low expectations for it. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. There's another thing I drifted into. Right. Yeah, that happened. Um, well, I'm very lucky with my daughter. She, she's, she's, she's very nice. Yeah, I met your daughter. She's lovely. Yeah, you've met my daughter. Yeah. I've met your son. You have. Um, yeah, but uh, someone asked me this. I was John Murray show, was it? And I just think it's like Harlan and Wolf where you just prepare them for a while and then send them out okay. off, the, off the skip way or whatever, slip way, yeah. and hope it doesn't end up like the Titanic. I don't know, who knows what, what's gonna happen in the future, but I find it easier as, they, as it gets, as they get older, when you can communicate with mm. them more. Um, but we're very, I'm lucky with Maud so far, you know, I, I do my best, you know. Um, but I, I had, it was like people say, oh, the day my daughter was born is the best day of my life. Whereas, <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being, Jesus, this is very traumatic altogether. Yeah, be terrified. 
Um, I was very anxious. Yeah. yeah. How were you? How are you? I was really anxious. I was, yeah. yeah. But did you feel it was like the best day of? Well, I felt very relieved when he was I felt born. Relief. Like I, I felt, cried. which is kind of yeah. Which I cried with relief. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, the, the the days before were, and and, and labour I found terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, apparently, you know, the woman. It's even worse for them. <laughs> I know two men talking about how terrible labour. When I was pregnant, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but no, I didn't. Uh, I uh, I couldn't. Inj- I couldn't look for. I couldn't anticipate anything beforehand. Yeah. I didn't want to. Go, you know. Compared that to watching the World Cup, yeah, that's much more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> so that they, watching the World Cup would be the the best days of your life, rather than the day. Yeah, you, I love watching yeah, the World Cup. Rather than the day. Yeah, that was born. fantastic. That's when I'm at my happiest watching yeah. the World Cup. Um, I'm not. Damn, that just sounds like I've diminished um, human life. No, I think you've kind of uh, made it seem but more. There's, more no, uh, more there's no anxiety with the World Cup. No, that's um, it. It's just it's just tremendous. And do you feel anxiety about when you say this idea that you, you you get them ready to go off into the world? Like, do you feel anxiety about that prospect? No, I don't. You know, I, I don't really think about, I don't think about it very much. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. You know, I spend so much worry during the pregnancy and, mm. Jesus, the, the solipsism of this. But... <laughs> Once every once she was born and yeah. everything was okay, it's it was, it's yeah. it's fine. And as she gets older and is more independent, and I can talk to her about stuff, um, it's fine. I'm lucky, you know. It's it could it could be worse. I mean, I wouldn't. I, you know, it's just responsibility. I, it's childlike with me. It's it's like I've always just associated responsibility with kind of anxiety in a way. Mm. And I was never really given much responsibility and I always kind of avoided it, you know? Yeah. Um, which is not, again, something else I regret. Maybe I should have, you know, joined the army or something. Not really. <laughs> but, um, yeah, responsibility, I, I, I try to avoid it, really, which isn't good. You can't avoid it with a, a child. Isn't well, you can. <laughs> 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 That's true. You can try but and avoid, try it, avoid but that, it, but that is, of course, massively irresponsible. Yeah. But I'm, I'm trying to be friends with her and, and communicate with her a lot. And um, yeah, it's fine. Like you know, I, I, it's, it's good. I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah. But we don't. I don't know what lies ahead during the difficult adolescent years. Mm. Um, yeah, and she'll have an embarrassing older father. You know, oh God, no, it's dad. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> oh Christ, so embarrassing. But anyway, that's, that's, um, maybe, a, you know, that's a few years away yet. Arthur, look, that's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.